Uh, the more we can incorporate these into our vegetable gardens, the less pesticides we have to use or the less uh, other types of uh, pest control methods uh, mm -hmm. are required. Native plants can play an important role in farm resilience. Creative farmers can use native plants in the farmscape to provide benefits such as biological pest control, bioremediation, and erosion control. In this episode of Voices from the Field, Eric Fusilet, an environmental project manager at the Arkansas and Oklahoma civil engineering firm Kraft & Tull, shares his knowledge of native plants and their benefits with INCAT agriculture specialist Nina Prater. Eric and Nina also talk about different ways farmers could create profitable enterprises with native plants, such as native forage species for livestock, native food crops, native cut flower production, or herbal medicines. Let's listen. Hello, I'm Nina Prater with MCAT's Southeast office here in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I'm joined today by Eric Fuselet. Um, and we are going to talk about native plants and the many ways that we can use them in our farmscape. So thank you for joining me today thank in you. person. Yes, thank you for having me. It's good to have a little bit of some pre-COVID normalcy. But, yeah, 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 it is really nice. Um, so let's just jump right in. Can you give me a little background on um, who you are, where you work, and how you got involved and interested in, in native plants? Well, definitely. Uh, yeah, I work for Craft & Toll uh, as an environmental project manager. I've been there for almost three years, but I've been doing environmental consulting for going on eight years. Um, so yeah, uh, one of the things I do with my job is I help our engineers and landscape architects with selecting uh, native plant species for our projects. These include uh, low impact development projects uh, that have, uh, with uh, rain gardens, detention ponds, bioswells. Uh, we do these projects for, for uh, commercial developments um, mm -hmm. and um, whatnot, residential development, neighborhoods, things like that. Um, so yeah, I uh, also serve as, uh, this year I'm serving as the president of the Arkansas Native Plant Society. I've been able to kind of take this passion and uh, apply it in that role and helping uh, re do a lot of outreach and promote the use of native plants. Uh, mm -hmm. And while the Native Plant Society is a little more focused on the conservation and education of the native plants in their natural habitat, there's another organization um, also uh, heavily involved in one called Wild Ones Native Plants Natural Landscapes. And that is a national organization that has chapters all around the country um, with uh, volunteers and members uh, and I chartered the local chapter here in Northwest Arkansas called the Ozark chapter uh, and also serve on the uh, national board for wild ones and so uh, whereas the Native Plant Society as I mentioned is more about uh, conserving native plants and educating people on the native plants and their natural habitats wild ones has more of a focus on promoting the use of native plants in the built environment or the landscape environment. Interesting. I didn't know about that distinction. Those are both really important, uh, you know, directions to Definitely. take, you know, preserving the ecosystems, the natural mm -hmm. ecosystems, but then also allowing the native plants back into <laughs> these, yeah. these developed landscapes. Definitely. I mean, it's this uh, change in landscape use that has such an impact on the ecosystem so it's kind of a, a you know a two-way interplay between those two because the the natural habitats provide as a seed source for local ecotypes for the native plants that we want to use in the built environment mm -hmm. you know but then whenever the um, these areas are developed and they go from either uh, a natural area into an agricultural area or a natural area turned into a uh, urban or suburban area, then there's a lot of that, uh, those native plant species that are um, removed and eliminated. And so that creates kind of a hole or an ecological desert, so to speak, for local pollinators and wildlife. Uh, and so the more development we have, the land use change we have, the harder it is for these insect populations and ultimately the other wildlife that relies on these native plants uh, as the base of the food chain mm -hmm. uh, to survive and then, you know habitat becomes much more fragmented so right. one way that we can help patch back in you know or as i like to word it weave back in the uh, some of the threads of the web of life is to use native plants in our urban suburban and agricultural environment mm -hmm. uh, this helps support insect populations and ultimately 
other like birds that rely on these insects. Mm -hmm. uh, deer oftentimes rely on native plants. Uh, there are other wildlife that, you know, you know, it supports the whole, uh, the web of life. So. Right. It's the base of the pyramid, you know, exactly. yep. <laughs> the plants and, and then, you know, from there, the insects and up. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think, I mean, I think people are slowly starting to become aware of, of insect, like they call it, what do they call it? The insect Armageddon or something. Yes. And then mm -hmm. the, um, and then the bird populations. There's been a decline there over yeah. the last several decades. Yeah. There's a significant decline. And like, I mean, you think about the monarchs, you know, mm -hmm. um, they traditionally, uh, historically would, you know, they leave this little mountain range in Mexico at the end of the winter, early spring, and they start migrating north. Uh, and, you know, they make it so far, like a population might make it to Arkansas, and then they look for milkweed uh, plants to lay their eggs on. Uh, and then um, once those eggs hatch, become caterpillars, and then later become adult butterflies, and they continue that migration pattern north, you know, might find another milkweed plant in northern Missouri or Iowa, you know, and then so on, and then, um, at the end of the year, they start to migrate back down to Mexico. So it's this multi-generational journey each year along the flyway uh, from Mexico to the northern United States, southern Canada, and then back to those that mountain range in Mexico. Uh, and they rely on those milkweed plants that, you know, for millennia were there mm -hmm. to support them in that migration. Uh, but here, um, with a lot of land use changes we've had, removing milkweeds, pesticide use, uh, you know, these milkweed populations have significantly declined along that flyway and that has resulted in a decline in the monarch population. Mm -hmm. uh, another species that would be, um, has been directly uh, impacted by land use changes are northern bobwhite quail. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people recall hearing these quail, you know, all the time 30 years ago, but uh, with the removal of so much of their native habitat, which they do heavily rely on, native plants for the grubs and insects to feed their young, mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, find cover in, um, mm -hmm. and to raise their, the next generation uh, of the quail. Uh, we've seen a significant decline just in the past 30 years that has been uh, attributed, uh, and I think even within the last 10 years, especially here in Arkansas, that has been attributed to that loss of habitat. So. Right, so it's really important for all of us in whatever way we can to, I like the language you use to weave those connections back, yep. you know, reweaving the re threads weaving. of the yeah. Of life. Yeah. Yes. It's, uh, you know, cause if we have any small piece of land, you can have an impact on, exactly. on these even, populations. Even if you live in an apartment, mm -hmm. uh, I first started growing native plants in containers when I lived in an apartment and it's just about knowing uh, which species could handle shade if you have a balcony or you know partial sun or full sun if you have a south facing you know apartment patio mm -hmm. um but yeah it's um there's usually a native plant species that you can find for any sort of uh, condition uh, right on the site right so, um i found a great quote about um biodiversity uh and which, you know, native plants, I mean, there's a huge range of native plants that, right. you know, talking about native plants is mm -hmm. a pretty big umbrella. Yes, yes. <laughs> but there, I found this quote that um, I think people will like. It says, conservation is not just about building another terrace. It's sharing the land with 100,000 other species. And this was um, said by Paul Johnson, the former NRCS chief. Okay. Um, and... What's that? Uh, yeah, it's, you know, and so I think a lot of times when people think about, you know, soil conservation or natural resource conservation, mm -hmm. you know, we think about like, you know, putting up a terrace to stop erosion right. or these sort of physical uh, designs mm -hmm. There, you know, elements we can impose on the landscape, mm -hmm. but it's really so much more complicated than that right. and so much more beautiful than that, you know, yes. sharing our land and our space, our farms, we are mm -hmm. sharing them with, I don't know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of species yes. when you're talking about plants mm -hmm. and insects and amphibians and birds and all of that beautiful mm -hmm. life. And so I think I, you know, I'm, I'm excited to dive into some ways that people can do Definitely. that with you today because, um, it's so important. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I talk about the five soil 
health principles a lot um, mm-hmm. with with farmers at workshops and things. Um, and one of those is that um, is really critical to the whole piece of like building soil health mm-hmm. is maximizing biodiversity mm-hmm. in our farmscapes um, because diversity above ground leads to diversity below ground and that leads to a really resilient farm system Mm -hmm. you know because if you've got a lot of things going and say you have a drought year Mm -hmm. at least you'll Mm -hmm. get income from something you know (laughs) exactly and that's really like the the, the biodiversity you know the natural ecosystem works the same way it does help our ecosystems become more resilient Mm -hmm. to environmental stressors right because when the more different species of plants native species that we have the more uh different species of insects are going to be supported the more species of birds Mm -hmm. uh, mammals and other wildlife are going to be supported uh so yeah i mean it's yeah the same concept would apply there as well if we think about how much um the economic benefit that pollinators provide for farms through pollination services right um you know if we you know aren't supporting these pollinators uh then you know ultimately it's going to be a lot more expensive to go out and you know pollinate our crops Um, right these these you know, insects provide a free service to us. And so the more that we can take care of them, the, the more that, uh, yeah. yeah. Higher that, yields and all of that. Exactly. Yeah. So it really is in our interest. Um, okay. So what makes a native plant a native plant? Uh, well, it gets really complicated if you want to really dig into it, but a simple working definition is that a plant species is native to the region where it evolved. Uh, so many of our ornamental plants and cultivars that we have been using over the past you know, several centuries are not from North America. And so they have not evolved here. They have not developed those special relationships with the other parts of the ecosystem. We mentioned the pollinators and wildlife. So they're not part of the local ecology. Uh, so the plants that are native to our region uh, have been co-evolving here for millennia. Uh, and they, you know, come to support species which depend on these plants uh, for food or to complete their life cycle. So uh, we mentioned how, uh, you know, songbird species rely heavily on caterpillars to feed their young. Mm-hmm. So without a lot of the uh, native wildflowers that support uh, butterfly and moth populations, these caterpillars would not be there uh, for these birds to feed their young. And then that has a cascading effect on bird populations. Right. And then there are other things that rely maybe on birds or certain birds mm-hmm. for, you know, food and whatnot. And so, mm-hmm. uh, the, when, you know, since native plants form that base of that pyramid, you know, when we remove them or significantly reduce them, it does have cascading effects on the other populations. In the right. Ecosystem. Right. And so the replacing them with non-natives, is creating what you said earlier like ecological a, desert yeah so to speak. Just, yeah you know like if you had a, a buffet you know that was out and then suddenly you replace it with you know a parking lot or you know <laughs> a, a building or right. you know a field uh, with plants that you can eat you know it's you know it's mm-hmm. like that uh, mm-hmm. and suddenly yeah then you'd have to go somewhere else and then maybe even compete with other populations in those areas right and i know that um, these non-natives have the potential to become invasive if Sometimes they don't they do. have the yeah. predators or the things that consume them to exactly. keep the numbers intact. In, exactly. You know, in like the text. checks, you know, on their population. Right. So we see that with Japanese honeysuckle, uh, mm-hmm. kudzu, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of these species that started off uh, as either ornamental or used for erosion control, you know, before we really realized uh, the impact that they would have in the ecosystem. But since we started to see, oh, these things really get out of hand and they replace not just native populations, but they can become a nuisance in themselves to land managers. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so that's one reason why if we stick to native species, uh, then we are reducing the amount of invasive species. Uh, Cause I mean, even some of the ornamentals we're choosing now, we may not realize, but until later that they are right might become invasive like think about bradford pear trees Mm -hmm. we still see those being used and those are you know horribly invasive Mm -hmm. Uh, i mean especially (laughs) right around here uh, the ozarks in march and you see them all in bloom you really can see how many of them are around especially on fence rows where they're not being you know able to be managed as easily Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so stick with the natives You'll be better off. <laughs> Definitely. And there are beautiful natives that can oh, be yeah. ornamentally. You know, I yeah. think that's the thing is um, just 
get the public on board uh, when it comes to ornamentals of just uh, like purple cone flower, a lot mm -hmm. of our milkweeds, butterfly milkweed, you know, mm -hmm. not only do you get to see that beautiful flower, uh, you know, like a black eyed Susan or, right. you know, uh, but then you get to enjoy uh, more birds visiting your yard, more butterflies. I mean, it really does enhance uh, the aesthetics of a property or storefront or yeah. anywhere you're wanting to use these. Yeah, it yeah. really does. Um, so what are some creative ways that farmers can, can use native plants on their land? Oh, well, one that might uh, directly apply to agriculture would be uh, for pest control. Um, I mean, we did talk about how native plants, um, you know, attract pollinators. So, I mean, there's a pollination services that, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, having native plants planted uh, within your orchard or within your, uh, you know, on the borders of your crop fields, so, you know, that's going to attract pollinators that will eventually attract, you know, that, those pollinators will eventually start to uh, visit the crops as well. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, you know, select species um, <clears throat> that will attract the specific pollinators you might need depending on what you're growing. Uh, but not only that, but a lot of these uh, pollinators and other insects that they attract um, act as pest control for other insects that, uh, you know, people working in agriculture don't want, you know, mm -hmm. such as aphids, you know, beetle larva, uh, you know, leaf hoppers, mealybugs, mites, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So like something like this common yarrow uh, attracts a wide range of beneficial insects that will then later consume and eat mm -hmm. a lot of those pests. Right, um, right. You know, black-eyed Susans are another great one uh, for pest control. Daisy fleabane, Ohio spiderwort. Um, I mean, there's been some great research done by Heather Holm uh, where uh, she has looked at, um, you know, a lot of the common pests that uh, vegetable growers struggle with and then the common the, in, the native insects that act as pest control on those mm -hmm. uh, pesky pesky insects and then which native species attract those beneficial insects and so right uh, the more we can incorporate these into our vegetable gardens the less pesticides we have to use or the less uh, other types of uh, pest control methods uh, mm -hmm. are required and it's let the plants do their work for you. You know, it's right. nice effort on our part. And, mm -hmm. uh, we get aphids out at our place, uh, and then I, I, you know, just leave them alone at first, and then I start noticing the ladybugs start showing up, and then there's right. no more aphids. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we, it's a little bit of you know of a delay, um, but I mean it doesn't, but not too terribly long, you know. Right. So I mean, it's you know people just need to realize if they just wait a few days, you know give the ecosystem its time to work itself out and a lot of these pests are going to be taken care of as long as you have enough native species to attract mm -hmm. you know, the beneficial insects. Right, um, right. And that ties into another um, soil health principle, which is minimize chemical disturbance. Right. So I always encourage people to design their farm to um, encourage uh, biological control of pests. Correct. So that's yes. what we're talking about. When we think about how many of these insects start off as larvae in the soil, you know, and mm -hmm. the more we're using pesticides that might be soil active, you know, or might have that effect on soil biology, um, it's going to infect, you know, impact the amount of beneficial insects it might have on their right. properties. Right. Well. Right. Yeah. So. so it all ties together. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's a web. <laughs> this is what people traditionally had. I mean, people don't realize this is, you know, a very traditional way of farming. We didn't have lawns 200 years ago. We had fields of like a lot of native grasses and mm -hmm. whatnot. And, you know, and so there, that was, you know, it is part of how things used to be, you know, this idea of, you know, this 20th century method that we had with the pesticides and the, um, you know, replacing our fields with like lawns or, you know, non-native grass pastures, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's had a cascading effect on, you know, other elements of the ecosystem and almost has perpetuated a, a perception of an increased need for the pesticides, you know, right. because the more or less people, um, you know, are educated on that or have forgotten, you know, how it used to be, uh, the, you know, the more they might think that they need to go buy a pesticide to, you know, zap some bugs, you know, that right. might be a pest, but, right. um, you know. Kill the dandelions in their lawn. Exactly. You know, it's like, <laughs> Becomes a what's wrong feedback. with dandelions? Right. Yeah, we need, yeah. I think we need a pro, you know, <laughs> pro biodiversity, 
biodiverse lawn group, you know? Definitely, definitely. <laughs> That's what One Thing Wild Ones is all about. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. trying to educate people and encourage people to, you know, create more natural living landscapes. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's great. So we can, farmers can use native plants for uh, pollinator habitat and beneficial insect habitat. Mm -hmm. um, what are some other ways that farmers can use native plants in their in their land well i mean there's forage grasses i mean we have a lot of native grasses that make great forage grasses for cattle mm -hmm. um i mean traditionally uh, you know this is what was used for a long time um, it's a lot of the native grasses that existed on the prairies here um you know in america were these native grasses that fed you know bison and you know other large um you know mammals um you know, for some that would, you know, work well here in uh, the Ozarks and for a lot of the eastern, uh, or I'm sorry, the mid, uh, the central and uh, uh, Midwest are going to be a lot of our native warm season grasses like uh, big blue stem, little blue stem, or Indian grass, or mm -hmm. if you have a low area then switch grass or eastern gamma grass. Um, I mean, switch grass it, it, uh, is not only grown as a forage grass, but uh, it's because of its high growth rate, it grows so fast and it produces so much biomass, it's also uh, being uh, grown as a biofuel crop. Right, So, right. Um, you know, switchgrass has a lot of other benefits besides just, you know, forage and biofuel. Um, but like your big blue stem, Indian grass, little blue stem, these are going to be more heat and drought tolerant. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, um, they, like I said, they grow really fast, um, produce a lot of biomass. Um, and so because of that, they're also just great for erosion control. Okay, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, switchgrass, it sucks up a lot of nutrients. Uh, if people were to plant these, that grass, say, along riparian areas, or if you have a stream or waterway that, mm -hmm. or a ditch that borders uh, a field where you might be applying, uh, agri uh, I'm sorry, um, fertilizer, manure. Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, that any time you have a heavy rain, that switchgrass is going to help. Um, slow down or uh, any sediment uh, that might be in runoff. Uh, mm -hmm. It's real thick and bushy. Uh, help it become deposited before you lose it. You know, for right. farmers, soil is your income. Exactly. You, know, you need to keep your soil. Um, but, you know, not only that, but because it grows so fast, it's pulling up so much nutrients. So it's great for uh, reducing the amount of nutrients that are entering streams and waterways. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a lot mm -hmm. of us know that, you know, when you have too many nutrients in the local waterway that leads to ecological issues like eutrophication mm -hmm. you know? exactly so yeah so slowing the water down settling the sediments capturing yep. the nutrients that's a lot of benefits for the Definitely. for the natural waterways and you know around ponds or streams mm -hmm. or anything like that it, Definitely. Could, it could be used yep that's great um so speaking of water management on a farm um you know, a lot of farms have, have you know, barns and, mm -hmm. you know, far, different farm buildings and things like that. And you've, you've done a lot of work with rain gardens. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what a rain garden is and, and how you use native plants in rain gardens? Certainly. Uh, yeah, a rain garden uh, is basically just a shallow depression planted with native uh, perennial vegetation, uh, that captured were that is strategically located uh, at the outfall of say you know where stormwater uh, runoff is exiting an impervious surface. So that could be uh, at the you know near the downspout of a gutter you know that's taking uh, accepting stormwater off of a roof. Um, if you have an impervious surface like a road or driveway something like that. Uh, if you, you know, near your barns, you know, you, you get a heavy rain, water comes down off the roof and, you know, might be transported through the gutter to a particular corner of that barn. Uh, you can create like a shallow depression uh, and choose specific species uh, that will uh, help suck up that rainwater, uh, make use of that rainwater, uh, but can also help purify or uh, improve that, the water quality of that water before it, um, uh, enters into you know our local waterway so uh you know it's, it helps slow it down capture it and uh, uh facilitates more infiltration into the soil profile mm -hmm. um, and so I mean, there's a wide range of benefits that native plants provide when it comes to improving water quality i mean there's um a lot of our uh, prairie grasses have very fibrous root systems 
Uh, and so that makes them great for breaking down organic contaminants like petroleum products, mm. or, uh, pesticides, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, so uh, all, all plants have the ability to facilitate the breakdown of low to moderate levels of petroleum contamination and stormwater runoff. So if you have a parking lot, say, you know, with you know, engine oil been dripping, or if you have an area on your farm where you typically work on, you know, equipment and whatnot, uh, well, when it rains, if there's an impervious surface there, it's going to pick up some of the petroleum and it might be contained in the runoff uh, that is, might, you know, have a negative effect on, you know, aquatic ecosystems. So, uh, what plants can do is they exude a lot of sugars and whatnot from their roots and this stimulates microbial activity in the soil and a uh, petroleum product being a hydrocarbon is actually food for some species of microorganisms. Hmm. And so they will metabolize that and help break it down into less toxic or non-toxic substances. Um, but, you know, all plants can do that, but some plants do it better than others. And the reason for that is that uh, some plants have thicker root systems, like a tap root or you know, like a tree with a larger root. And so the root zone, uh, the volume of soil that is taken up by the root zone is less for those species that mm -hmm. say many of our native prairie grasses like big blue stem switchgrass uh, that have these very fibrous roots. And so these right. very fibrous roots have a greater surface area taken up by the root zone or the rhizosphere. Um, uh, within the volume of soil underneath it. So mm -hmm. uh, they are providing more of that benefit of breaking down these organic contaminants uh, when we use these species. That's, I think that's really great for people to think about. Mm -hmm. Like, um, not only can these plants uh, just support life above ground, but they can protect, mm -hmm. you know, our natural waterways um, from these contaminants, you know, a lot of people on farms have tractors. Not yes. everybody. So, yeah, sure. yeah. You have <laughs> and, yeah. and not, they're not always in the best shape. So right. sometimes <laughs> they leak. And, you know, as even with our good intentions of mm -hmm. being sustainable farmers, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard to get away from petroleum products. But strategically right. locating these catch zones, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, with these native grasses could be a good way to... Definitely, yes. You know, yeah. prevent, prevent doing off-farm damage right you and, know. You mean, and, and the same could be applied with the nutrients i mean if you strategically locate it or have a pond that's you know going to capture stormwater runoff before it enters a stream you know you can use species that are going to help suck up those nutrients or you know, also break down any contaminants if you're or maybe they're uh, pesticides that were historically applied uh, like an orchard or somewhere um, and there's going to be heavy metals sometimes associated with that contamination mm -hmm. in the soil mm -hmm. Uh, so, I mean, native phreatophytes, are, which are species that uh, have these deep roots or roots that rely heavily on groundwater to support themselves, are great um, for, um, you know, they, they tend to grow fast and they produce you know, a lot of biomass, you know, things like uh, black willow, uh, eastern cottonwood, box elders. Uh, these are great species uh, for uh, pulling up heavy metals that might be nutrients for these plants or pulling up excess nutrients. Uh, in that storm water. Uh, so using these types of species um, are just, uh, especially along the edge of a farm pond, along a riparian area, along a stream, uh, is really going to help improve water quality, uh, both on your farm and downstream. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, that was phreatophytes. Phreatophytes, P-H-R-E-A-T-O-P-H-Y-T-E-S. <laughs> that is a new yeah. word for me. I haven't heard that one before. I'm going to have to read about that. <laughs> yeah, they tend to be found in either wet areas or very arid areas, like in the desert. So, you know, here in, hmm. you know, the you know, eastern central United States, these are more likely to be found in these um, you know, wet areas. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, if you are in the southwest or somewhere, it's much more dry. A lot of free out of fights are going to be uh, found. Uh, you're going to have, you know, some of that more arid region free out of fights out there. Because they are woody species with this high growth rate, um, well, let me back up. Traditionally, if you were trying to remediate heavy metal contamination in soil and you use herbaceous species, well, you have to harvest those herbaceous species afterwards. Otherwise, and then remove them. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That can be done by either composting them or burning them in a safe way to capture any uh, contaminants. 
Um, like arsenic and things like that. Right. Yeah. Uh, lead, you don't want it to become volatile and in the atmosphere. Right. Um, but with the woody species, especially when it comes to poplars and willows, uh, this is, it's becoming uh, sequestered in the biomass of the tree. So as it grows, you know, it's sucking up a lot of heavy metal, but then it uh, becomes sequestered. So, um, you know, that's another alternative that you wouldn't have to go back and harvest it each year. Oh. by using those species. Interesting. Only concern is sometimes those heavy metals can make it into pollen. So, you know, there's a concern there. Research is being done on how to prevent it from entering the trophic chain. Right. So, you know, right. so they've done, they've created these hybrid poplar and willow species that um, I believe don't produce any sort of, I um, can't remember if it's flowers or pollen or something like that. They're pretty much sterile. Mm -hmm. So, and that just prevents those heavy metals from entering the trophic chain. Okay. And then eventually, do you have to like remove the wood? Just not like every year? If it's a full on phyto what's called phytoremediation or using plants to remediate soil, then a lot of times, uh, depending on the contaminant, they might let it grow for uh, a while and they'll fence it off to prevent deer to get in there. You know, you don't want herbivory uh, on, you know, stuff like that. That's mm -hmm. another way that. Uh, you know, those contaminants might enter the food chain or the trophic chain in the ecosystem. But um, for something that's on the level that's not like a brownfield site or a former mm -hmm. industrial site or a place of a toxic chemical spill, that sort of thing, if you're just talking about a farm, then typically you can just leave that there. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about more lower levels of contamination that, right. you know, still has a cumulative effect, you know, as we have more farm activity on the landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, but locally, you know, it's, um, you know, a less rate, uh, I mean, a small, lower rate of these contaminants. Right. So. That makes sense. Right. So those, so we've got forage species, um, pest control, pest control, uh, beneficial habitat, mm -hmm. pollinators, um, erosion control, pollutant nutrient pollution control these uh native plants can do a lot and we're not even done oh no no <laughs> there's, there's a lot of uses. <laughs> so um you know forage is one way that farmers could actually like you know make money off of native plants what are right. there's a lot of other ways yeah i mean there's a lot of native species that it can be grown as food crops i mean uh pawpaws are the this the largest native fruit uh, bearing plant here in North America. Uh, there are, uh, you know, more cultivated type varieties that will produce pawpaws that have a longer shelf life. I mean, a lot of what has prevented pawpaws uh, from becoming a more commercially viable fruit is they you know, tend to have a short shelf life. But mm -hmm. that's not to say that they can't still be sold locally at farmer's markets or be included with CSAs, that sort of thing. Um, and you think about a lot of uh, our agricultural uh, species that are berries are native here to North America. We talk about strawberries. Uh, that's a Native American berry. Uh, the wild strawberries, we have a lot of those growing out at our property. And every year in June, we really mm. enjoy picking the wild strawberries. They have uh, the best flavor. Yeah, it's like, yeah, a giant strawberry, but can, you know, or it's, it's small, but it's like a normal store-bought strawberry, all of it condensed down yeah. into a smaller fruit. I, oh, yeah. And so whereas a lot of store-bought strawberries, you often have that bland white part, you know, these are just pure strawberry flavor. Mm -hmm. So when you have a bowl of those, it's just, yeah. Um, you know, we also share it with this box turtle population that likes to visit our property every, every June. We notice them in there eating the strawberries, but there's usually plenty to go around for both of us. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, wild raspberries, wild blackberries, you know, the native varieties are going to have more thorns, but there are, of course, thornless uh, cultivars that have been created, uh, wild blueberries, uh, and the muscadines. That's a native grape species here in uh, the southern United States um, that is often grown commercially. So mm -hmm. muscadine wine, muscadine, muscadine grape juice, uh, you know, that might be another option uh, to grow. I mean, the, the wild species I find are uh, just as delicious as some of the more cultivated uh, varieties. So Yeah, we also, they're so good. Yes. So we have a few <laughs> different species of native passion fruit uh, oh. here in North America. I mean, one of the more common ones, especially here in the Ozarks, is going to be Passiflora incarnata. Okay. Uh, but that's the same 
um, you know, a lot of people see the flowers, you know, passion flowers. They have those real stringy looking petals. You know, very beautiful. Very beautiful. Very sort of alien. Though. They look like they don't belong here. They're really, yeah. you know, they're related to those tropical passion fruit, which are grown more agriculturally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you see passion fruit juice, I mean, that's typically what you have. But I mean, the flavor of these are native passion fruits, just the same. It's delicious. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite wild edibles. So, I mean, I'd like to, you know, I think that these could definitely be grown, grown, especially, you know, for more local markets, you know, mm -hmm. for, um, yeah, for some income. Right. So, and then there's the medicinal properties that passion fruit, passion vine uh, provides, um, mm -hmm. as, uh, for anxiety, as a sedative, mild sedative. I mean, it does, um, you know, you go to a lot of herbal or health food stores and sometimes you'll see uh, passion leaf, uh, you know, the medicinal herb section. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, another option you know, that it could be grown for. Uh, I mean that, but above ground vine regrows each year, so harvesting it isn't going to harm the population uh, oh, as long yeah. as the underground uh, roots are left intact to re regrow the next year. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, there's different herbs and spices. Uh, mountain mints are delicious. One of our native mints that also support a lot of in variety of insect populations. I mean, uh, I think that one's not you you know thought of enough when it comes to growing mints. I mean, you can be growing a field of that, say, uh, to be supporting insect populations. And then when it reaches the end of its, you know, year, you can harvest it and use the uh, leaves, dry them and uh, mix delicious peppermint tasting tea. Uh, there's wild oregano or also known as dittany that mm -hmm. my wife and I like to collect um, and she'll make a delicious uh, pizza sauce uh, out oh. of that. And it's, it's like Me. oregano Wild bergamots, one of our bee bombs, uh, mm -hmm. I believe Renarda fistulosa, I believe is its Latin okay. name. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's that's another another great one. Um, so, um, but not only that, I mean, we talk about tree, trees and shrubs, and we mentioned pawpaws, but I mean, slippery elms. I mean, those are a lot of times considered a pest tree, but out uh, in agricultural areas, I mean, where you might have a lot of them growing, just, uh, consider that the inner bark um, you know, it has been used uh, in the past for throat lozenges. You know, you can make a, a tea with the inner bark, uh, help with upset stomachs, sore throats, indigestion, right. digestive irritation, stomach ulcers, coughs, I mean, a wide range of medicinal properties. So, I mean, that's something that could also be harvested and uh, sold um, mm -hmm. to like health food stores or herbal right. places that sell herbal remedies. Mm -hmm. Persimmons. I mean, that's another one. Oh yeah, I but, love you know, persimmons. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, you're looking for something to, you know, sell to the farmers market in late summer, early fall. You know, like around October here is when they start to get ripe. You know, and that, mm -hmm. um, or sugar maples for syrup. Even uh, pecans are native to North America. Right. You know, that's one of our native nut trees. Uh, that would be great. Um, you know, for people to grow. I mean, you think about each one of those nuts is there because there was a flower that was pollinated, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, well, those actually might be wind pollinated now. So think of it, but it still provides habitat and other benefits for wildlife. Oh yeah. So, I mean, birds and whatnot live in its trees. Squirrels. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just learned uh, from a kids' nature show that blue jays eat huge amounts of acorns. Oh really? Huh. They can like store them in their pouches. Oh wow. Thank yeah, you, wild crats. Thank you, PBS <laughs> yeah. kids. My daughter loves wild crats. <laughs> yes. It's a great show. But, I mean, we're talking about supporting bird populations, exactly. you know, oak trees. I guess that's not... Yeah. Uh, well, oaks uh, are really important for, yeah, pollinators. I mean, they may be wind pollinated, but they support a lot of other insects. It's, it's host plant, uh, mm -hmm. wild cherries, uh, you know, a lot of the hickories, uh, maples. I mean, these are great for just supporting wide ranges of different numbers of beneficial insects in mm -hmm. life. And they find more species living on those when they do a survey of an oak tree than they would on a lot of our other non-native ornamental trees. So I mean, right. these are just great options for helping uh, keep some of that ecosystem intact so that these farmers could then later reap the benefits of having these pollinators around uh, for right. um, other benefits. We've talked about pest control, pollination, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know um, farmers, a lot of farmers are exploring silvopasture options mm -hmm. and, and agroforestry and 
and that kind of thing. So mm-hmm. thinking native trees when you're making these plans Definitely. and designs is, could be a really good opportunity. Well, trees make great windbreaks for mm-hmm. you know wind erosion control. Mm-hmm. So I mean, you know, including these native trees uh, for your windbreaks. I mean. I mean, think about also, we talked about common yarrow attracting a lot of benefits, uh, attracting a lot of the beneficial insects that would act as pest control. Common yarrow is also a medicinal herb as well. So, right. I, mean, uh, I mean, the leaves and the flowers have uh, medicinal value. Um, and you, this is often used in these herbal remedies. So, I mean, not mm-hmm. only could you include it among your crops for pest control, but then at the end of the year, after it's done doing its thing, you could harvest it leave the roots intact, and then, um, you know, you have something else that you're able to sell at a farmer's market or to a local, you know, natural food store. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Purple cone flowers, another one, Echinacea, is saying it's an immunostimulant, and it's probably one of the most researched uh, herbal remedies out there. It has been found through a lot of, um, you know, scientific research to have a lot of benefits. Um, They've done a lot, especially over there in Europe, I uh, believe, where a lot of research has taken place. Uh, but that's another one that is a butterfly magnet. So yeah. even if you're growing it, um, it's you know going to provide all kinds of other benefits. And then at the end of the year, you can harvest the above ground portion and it'll grow back the next year. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, so And it's, again, so beautiful in the landscape. Yep. We have some of those growing at our place. Um, it started out as one little one that took from some like, yes. seed mix I threw, <laughs> and it's grown and grown and grown. And Definitely. when we were walking by it yesterday, I couldn't even count the butterflies. There yeah. were so many butterflies and so many different species. Mm-hmm. I'm not great at IDing butterfly species, mm, me either. but <laughs> I was yeah. like, oh, I got this swallowtail, okay, <laughs> yes. big swallowtail, and then like all these different little ones. And I was so, it was just so cool to try yeah. and try and figure out how many different, but I couldn't, there were too many to count. It That's was so cool. That's the thing too about some species of butterflies, the male and the female have different forms yeah. as well. Yeah. So, and I did misspeak about cornflower. It's the roots that have the medicinal property. That I think studying. the whole plant does. Oh, does it? Okay. I think so. I think I've read that uh, like the root might have it more concentrated, but the leaves can okay. too. Gotcha. So. I think. But I just, when you talked about how they spread, you know, if they're happy in an area, they will you know, so selectively harvesting, if it were the roots right. that you're trying to harvest, yeah. and it's definitely a viable uh, thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just, we have a nice patch out at our place, and it's just, we watch bumblebees, we watch butterflies, we watch moths, we watch uh, goldfinches come and land on them and eat mm-hmm. the seeds, and we just have a wide variety of different, uh, you know, other wildlife that depend on those. It's just very op- education just for the kids. I mean, right. I'll, you know, see the kids out there just staring, uh, you know, they might go out to get clothes off the line and then get distracted by watching the bumblebees move from flower to flower. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, I'm, you know, you start to look like, where are they? You look out there, it's like, oh, we'll, we'll let them have that minute for them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm just glad they're out there watching. Oh, yeah. <laughs> enjoying it. So. You know, it. I just had this thought that, like, a lot of times farmers, you know, we produce food and mm-hmm. we get this total totally amazing sense of fulfillment from like feeding our communities Mm -hmm. like healthy food Mm -hmm. and i just realized i think you can get the exact same sense of fulfillment by feeding your your ecosystem healthy food like just this excitement of like i planted these native plants and Mm -hmm. now there's now it's covered in butterflies like i get that same sense of like I've done something good for the world, yeah, you know, yeah. when you see that kind of thing. Well, we have, I mean, we have just a little less than an acre and, you know, we have, you know, deer that will just wander through our yard and, you know, kind of eat our blackberries and whatnot. And, um, we have, you know, everything from groundhogs to last fall, we saw a covey of quail three different times. Oh, that, wow. was, that was kind of our real big reward. Like, okay, this is why we're doing this. You know, right. I mean, we're getting, we live near uh, a, a national park that's doing a lot of quail habitat restoration. So I think we oh, got some of the wonderful. residual benefits from mm-hmm. that. But uh, when my wife purchased the land before we were married, it was an illegal dump site. A lot of household trash had been dumped out there by some people years and years before we had it. So we cleaned all that up and it had been overtaken too by a lot of invasive species and noxious species and we've been working to eradicate those and we're still trying to get rid of lespedeza and tall fescue Uh, but we've been able to establish enough native plants that you know just seeing the quail you know moving around the property and 
a little cubby that was just a uh, a little a treat just yeah. knowing what that land used to be and knowing now oh, yeah. after six seven years what it is supporting you mm-hmm. know mm-hmm. so that is so fulfilling definitely <laughs> definitely and then there's a whole, you know, flowers. People want to, you know, that might be able to grow flowers for far more smockets. I mean, there's a lot of native wildflowers like Black Eyed Susan's Purple Cone Flower, mm-hmm. wild, you know, Common Yarrow that's going to be uh, great in bouquets um, mm-hmm. and whatnot. We, you know, pick a few and put a little, you know, in a vase on our table throughout the year. We have yeah. our different seed, you know, when we get into late summer, we're starting to see more golden rods and mm-hmm. asters in our vase. But like this yeah. time we got the purple cone flowers and the bergamot and mm-hmm. bee bombs and mm-hmm. all that. And so it just, you know, I think that's another source of income. Um, yeah, you know, definitely. One way to kind of, thin, if you have a thick patch of one of these species, it's kind of, you know, clip some of them, thin them out a little bit and mm-hmm. um, give some space for the others to grow. and. Uh, right. still be economically viable or contribute to a farmer's income. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that is a really good point with a lot of these natives, you know, learning how to harvest them so that they will come back right? Yeah. and will have a healthy population, like sustainable, Definitely. you know, sus- into the future. Definitely. Is probably a key to yeah, having I mean, this There's work. some annuals that, of course, rely on, you know, going through their life cycle, producing seed to have the next year's population, but then the perennials, or especially the herbaceous ones, are going to, you know, regrow from the soil each year, like mm-hmm. coneflowers, black-eyed susans, that mm-hmm. sort of thing. And so, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it's about knowing the species and its growth pattern and, you know, making sure that when you harvest it that you're going to make sure that they're included in the next year's growth. So. And you mentioned goldenrod. That's another native. Yeah, that, there's several um, different species of native. I just rods. learned a few years ago that mm-hmm. has medicinal properties. It does. Yeah, yeah the roots, flowers, and leaves. Uh, you can make a tea with it. Um, it's meat. It's diuretic. Uh, mm-hmm. So I mean, it can be used if you have urinary tract infections. Um, it's been used by the Native Americans for snake bites and fevers. Um, I mean, it has a wide range of uses. Uh, and there are some that are considered more noxious in like a garden setting. Uh, we don't mind it so much at our place just because we're, uh, it's an, it supports native um, populations, a goldenrod beetle that uh, depends a lot on goldenrod. Um, and so, uh, but you know, people that might live in a more urban or suburban environment might want to stick to certain goldenrod species that are a little, uh, uh, a little better behaved in the garden, so to speak. To use one of <laughs> less uh, aggressive. Yes, yeah. Um, but uh, so they're different. But you know, for like a a, a less managed uh, area, or for something that's a little more out in the country, outside of town. I mean, uh, a lot of these golden rods are just fine, and they mm-hmm. will. You know, these native species that uh, are aggressive, like I love some of the, the daisy flea veins or the golden rods, are also going to help with weed suppression. Um, I mean. This is one that I would, you know, I think would be great in areas under like utility corridors, you know, power lines where they're trying to suppress, you know, um, shrubs and you know, trees and whatnot uh, from mm-hmm. growing instead of spraying. You know, if we use these native aggressive species, then, you know, that's really going to help outcompete some of those native species. So, I mean, there is a place for them, um, mm-hmm. I think, in uh, the landscape, yeah. the, in the managed or the built environment right. as well. So. Interesting. That's a great point. I never thought about using native species to outcompete other species, like less desirable species. Right. And I feel mm-hmm. like a lot of the time we're talking about having to like replace mm-hmm. like Bermuda grass or fescue, which are mm-hmm. pre- they're pretty. <laughs> They're pretty Tough. aggressive, yes. <laughs> to get yeah. rid of. And so, you know, replacing them with native mm-hmm. species, you know, you have, really have to fight for the space for right. the native species to be able to succeed. I mean, there are a lot of native species that aren't that aggressive, and that's why they get out-competed by those grasses. Uh, yeah. Like fescue is aleopathic, so it's able to kill a lot of those things off in the soil to help uh, it out-compete with the natives. But mm-hmm. Bermuda grass, I mean... You want to take something and shade it out, and we'll get a fast-growing native species in there, and that's going to shade out uh, that shade intolerant uh, mm-hmm. species. Mm-hmm. I mean, if some of it's knowing what invasive you're trying to control, or what noxious species you're trying to call, control, and what conditions does it not like, and right. what they, you know. But there's some of those like tall fescue is going to be a little bit more of a uh, you know con- 
issue you know it's going to be a little more of a challenge but mm -hmm. that's not to say that it still couldn't be replaced uh you know somehow um burning uh, is one way to control tall fescue uh, to burn it in the uh in the spring uh mm -hmm. lose the time to, for burning to control it and then if you have some native species that will uh grow and uh, replace it before it's able to get reestablished, and sometimes that can be the way to do that um mm -hmm. interesting so yeah, you really have to learn what you're trying to control, its life cycle, exactly. and then what thing, the life cycle of the other options to replace right. it, yeah. to really yeah. get, get things working for you. Yes, yeah. yeah, there's some yeah some thought that has to be involved here, and that's not to say that, I mean, that's one of the reasons why Wild Ones is here, is to uh, help provide that guidance to landowners, mm -hmm. land managers, uh, to help, help them with that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, we have a site committee where uh, if you're located, um, you know, northwest Arkansas, uh, then uh, we we're, we have volunteers that will come out and give you advice or guidance on, you know, what could work out at your property. Well, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's a great segue into, you know, I, I could, you know, just chat about native species all day, but this podcast <laughs> is not supposed to be that long. So... <laughs> So I'd love to leave our listeners with some resources, books, mm -hmm. uh, places to go where they can go learn, um, find information about their own native plants in wherever they are in the country. Because, you know, what works here in the Ozarks is going to be very different from like right. the Pacific Northwest Definitely. or, you know. Yes. <laughs> so um, what are some things you could recommend people, people look for? Um, to learn more about this well on a national scale i mean i would think i mean there's uh wild ones is a pretty large organization nationally we have chapters uh, we're, we're not quite established in the pacific northwest but we have chapters in colorado and a lot of the eastern united states mm -hmm. so i mean uh, going to wildones.org uh, and finding out where your local chapter is uh, might be an option either joining that chapter or reaching out for that chapter uh, for help or guidance on what you're trying to do here in the Ozarks, I mean, we have Oz uh, our website for the Ozark chapters, ozark.wildones.org. And so we, on our chapter website, have a lot of resources on what native plants would grow given to certain site conditions at your property, uh, where you can source your native plants. You know, it's important to try to get local ecotypes as much as possible, you know, and try to make sure that the seed came from populations generally, you know, as close to the site as possible. I mean, 50 mm -hmm. Miles is probably going to be your, your, you know, depending on where you are and how much is available, it's going to be, uh, you know, about the best you can do uh, currently until, you know, there's a lot more supply. That, you right. Know, um, the demand is there. The supply seems to be still catching up to the demand uh, for native plant species. Now, that's another uh, thing we should mention bef mm. before we finish for the day yes. is... Another way farmers could make money is potentially growing native plant exactly. seeds or native plant starts. Yes, I mean, there's for sale. a lot of interest and a lot of market demand right now for native plants. And then depending on where you are, and especially here in the Ozarks, uh, the amount that's being produced is not able to meet that demand. And so, um, yeah, that's one thing that people could do is start growing more native plants in their greenhouses. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and there's other groups beyond just uh, you know, res you know, people that want to plant them in their gardens. I mean, there's uh, state DOT, like the Department of Transportation, that uh, has a need for native seed. Uh, other farmers uh, have a need for native seed if they're trying to use this stuff, uh, for, you know, for um, on their properties or for native forage. I mean, there's uh, a need, you know, for by these large land managing agencies for native seed. And so growing a, a field of something where you're going to get a lot of seed is going to be very beneficial. I mean, there's uh, some of these places are having to order their seed from as far away as either Pennsylvania or South Texas, you know, those are mm -hmm. local ecotypes, so this is the best they can currently do. So uh, Jennifer Ogle here in Arkansas is heading up uh, the Arkansas Native Seed Program, which is kind of a cooperative um, a partnership between NRCS and Game, Arkansas Game and Fish, oh, which you know, reminds me of another um, agency that likes native plants, native seeds are going to be your U.S. Fish and Wildlife, your state you know, uh, conservation department or Game and Fish. I mean, they have wildlife food plots they try to plant mm -hmm. in wildlife management areas, and they're always looking for native seeds, especially local ecotypes. Um, so that would be another potential place where this stuff could be sold. 
uh, but the Arkansas Native Seed Program is trying to uh, get more local native seed produced here in Arkansas for uh, the market there. Um, great. Know, these, That's great to know. Definitely. Okay, so I interrupted you. I apologize. Oh, You're talking well, about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mentioned wild ones. Uh, wild ones, yeah. You know, a lot of states have a native plant society. Uh, here in Arkansas, the Arkansas Native Plant Society, we have a, a blog that we come out with called Know Your Natives, you know. Mm -hmm. And all of that's going to be, you know, more education on, you know, some of the uh, more rare species in our state, or, you know, and it's got the more common ones too, but. Uh, it's just great to learn about what might be on your property to know what's native and what's not when you're deciding what might need to be removed or um, what you know you might want to keep so or what might mm -hmm. be potentially a rare species that you want to help protect you know right you know that adds value to your land um, so um, but we do guided hikes in the region um, we do various outreach presentations things like that uh, we have our membership meetings twice a year so I just recommend people find out what their local, their state native plant society is and reach out to them or see about joining them and learning more about the native plants out on their properties or in the natural areas around where they live. Around, yeah. So. Great. Yeah, this past year of being, working from home mm -hmm. in the pandemic, um, I had more time to walk around our property than yeah. I ever had before. Yep. You know, <laughs> I need a 15 minute break from, from... <laughs> being at home with children yeah. so I'm gonna go for a walk in the woods and I you know with a little you know I plant item and occasion mm -hmm. app or occasionally posting to Facebook sure. what is this plant you know yeah. I learned so many new species that I never knew yeah. and I've lived in the same place for like 14 years so yeah. yeah I walk around our place and I see speaking depending on what time of year I might see a species I didn't see the previous year right you know, it's yeah just, it's, it's hard to catch all the species that bloom exactly. throughout the year so it is it yeah. is and it's it is great to know mm -hmm. what's there and, and what's beneficial and what could possibly be an invasive. Right. Uh, you know, catch it while it's small. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I have Japanese silk grass at my property that uh, the first year I didn't know what it was. Like, huh, oh, that's interesting. Second year, it's like, oh, there's more of it. What is this? Third year, I learned what Japanese silk grass was like, oh, that's what that is. Yeah. It's like really spread at that point. So right. I started looking into it and learned it's an annual. Uh, so uh, one way uh, to get it is right before it's going to seed uh, here in the mid to late summer. I, you know, last year I took a uh, weed eater and just kind of whacked it all down. And so much of it, I mean, it's, because it's an annual, the roots aren't that deep and it's easy to pull up. But, you know, that's an easier option when you don't have a ton of it. Right. And I was getting to a point where it was getting out of control. So I, you know, went after it with a weed whacker. And I know there's, uh, you know, some seeds still on the ground. That I'll have to go after again this year, but you know, knowing that it's an annual and that I can control it that way, and hopefully uh, not have to. Right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that was one that surprised me. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, I keep distracting you. So, our <laughs> right. Native Plant Society, wild ones, oh. and then. Um, I was going to mention iNaturalist, is that you mentioned I apps. Naturalist, That's yeah. a great app. Uh, to have on your phone to identify things. Uh, even if you're not able to identify it or if it doesn't know, what you can do is you save it. And then uh, there are people that just, that's what they like to do is get on there and identify other plants that were, you know, not known hmm. or what people didn't know. And so I uh, think you'll find if you upload some clear enough photos and enough of different parts of the plant, uh, if you check it in a few days, a lot of times there's somebody that's gone on there and has told, you know, figured out what it is for you. So, that's great. And it's a, a citizen science type effort because uh, mm -hmm. in the more it gets uploaded to it, it has artificial intelligence that's able to get better at identifying things. So, cool. it's, um, I mean, it's, you know, very, it can usually at least get it down to a genus if it mm -hmm. can't get it down mm -hmm. to the species for you. And right. that's just another great resource and um, other researchers and state agencies like Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission rely a lot on uh, what people are posting to figure out, okay, where are some of the invasives in our state? Where are the, some of the native species that we mm -hmm. might want to you know, take interest in if it's a species that might be considered a rare or threatened one, that sort of thing. Uh, so that's something that's used by conservation agencies as well. Mm -hmm. um, so you're helping out just by taking photos and uploading things to a naturalist. That's very cool. And it does more beyond plants. It will do bugs, reptiles, mammals, uh, all sorts of stuff. Well, now I know what I'm going to do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds fun. <laughs> um, any other resources you wanted to mention? Um, 
Not so much for, um, I mean, I have know of several great field guys that are going to be more specific to Arkansas, but I know that the audience for this podcast is a little more broad than that. Mm-hmm. Um, but just uh, like different, you know, getting hold of a, a just regular native plant field guide, field guide wherever yeah. you are is a right. good resource. I mean, Falcon guides, uh, they usually have some native wildflower field guides for, you know, different regions across the country. Mm-hmm. And that's just, uh, that's the way I started learning was just taking a field guide hiking with me. Uh, and then I started learning about more about plant keys and how to key out things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, you know, learning about, you know, the, the flora that we have around, you know, around us here in this region, mm-hmm. uh, started off for me as, you know, just as a hiker backpacker. You know, wanting to learn more about what I was seeing and what I might be able to nibble along on the trail and mm-hmm. maybe cook at my campsite and just kind of enhance my outdoor experience. And uh, eventually I started learning more about the non-edible, non-medicinal native plants and just mm-hmm. the ecological benefits of it. And now I'm able to apply this knowledge professionally, uh, especially when it comes to designing, you know, beautiful, aesthetically pleasing rain gardens and bioswells and mm-hmm. tension ponds and, you know, applying these uh, remediation, phytoremediation concepts and native plants to the stormwater control uh, infrastructure you know, right. to improve environmental quality while also providing benefits to wildlife and insects. So. Mm-hmm. Well, that's great. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining me today. This has been yeah. great and I hope we've given people plenty of ideas yeah. so they can <laughs> implement, implement, you know, put some native plants in on their property somewhere. <laughs> Just start small yep, that's and, the way to do and it. get planting. Yep, start small and let it grow. And, and, you know, if anyone is interested in reaching out, I mean, I can leave my email address or... Sure, I can um, link to it. Um, okay. Just put a link to it in below the podcast on our website. That sounds good. Okay. Thank you for having me. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. Additional information about this episode and related resources can be found at atra.incat.org. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Voices from the Field wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Rich Myers. ATRA, Voices from the Field, is produced by the National Center for Appropriate Technology, headquartered in Butte, Montana. It's supported by the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service as part of NCAT's ATRA Sustainable Agriculture Program. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this recording are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the USDA or NCAT. We'll catch you again next week, and until then, keep on farming.